Romans 13. Okay, this is the final in the series that we're doing on uh, Baptist distinctives. And this is the final uh, part of what we're going to be looking at with regard to separation. Um, I have yours, but I, can, I have your little printout. I just can't get it printed out. I'm sorry, I'll see if I can get it um, between services with the printer in the back. Uh, you, don't, you don't need to print it, you just email it. Okay, oh, yeah. okay, I think I'm sorry. <laughs> um, That's my first okay, so Romans 13. Uh, we separated separation into three sections that we wanted to look at. First was personal, second was ecclesiastical, and then uh, what we're looking at today, would, uh, what's traditionally when you look at Baptist distinctives, as far as if you've ever been taught Baptist distinctives, it's always listed as being separation of church and state. So I just listed it as civil, just makes it easier. Uh, but uh, so we're, that's what we're looking at today, civil, or separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. Uh, Romans 13. Okay, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers for there is no power but of God. Okay, the powers that be are ordained of God. Mm -hmm. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Uh, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Okay, and then wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also <clears throat> for conscience sake. And then for this cause pay ye tribute also for they that are God's ministers attending continually or excuse me, for they are ministers uh, tending continually um, upon this very thing, and then render to all, therefore, render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and then honor to whom honor. Okay, that's a long passage uh, that we looked at. Good morning. And it's addressing our responsibility to human government. Now, who established human government? I know we just read that. God did. Okay, now, where's, where do we see that actually being initiated? Genesis 10. Yes, and that was as a result of... Um, hmm. Wait a minute now. I'm not sure exactly where he established it, but it was after the flood, after the judgment of the flood. Yeah, no, no, no I mean, I meant as far as like what, what was, what was his, what was his reason, or what was his stated purpose given with regard to that? Well, he instituted the death penalty at that point, and human government really kind of. I'm not sure. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, his. Declaration with regard to that. Okay, we okay. What is separation of church and state? So that begs the question: What is separation of church and state? When we got in Genesis chapter, well, actually, you know, turn there, turn to Genesis ten. Everything that he established following would be as a result of the fact that if you go to Genesis six, actually, you know, go to Genesis six, go to Genesis six, and we'll see the setup for what happens. <clears throat> Genesis 6. Then it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, uh, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that, of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not uh, always strive with man, uh, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Uh, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, 
the same became mighty men which were men of old, of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man's uh, the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. And our saving grace here. Verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then he's going to go, hi, good morning. We're in Genesis 6. Genesis 6, where is coming in? Genesis 6. Okay. If we, if we were to continue on reading the narrative all the way through 10, after Noah and his sons and the wives all come off the ark following the flood and the receding of the waters, uh, we see that Noah offers a sacrifice unto the Lord. He builds an altar, offers a sacrifice. The Lord receives it and he says he smells a sweet smelling savor and then he gives law at that point and he says okay by if man shed man's blood by man's blood shall shall it be shed so in other words now he institutes death penalty and we have the first institution of what would be considered human government reason being is at this point <clears throat> how are they governed what how, how are men being governed prior to Noah being told hey now you can Every man did that was right in his own eyes. Yeah, but actually it was it was by conscience, and mm -hmm. you know they had conscience really to, to govern them, and the fact was even with conscience, men still went ahead and committed wickedness. And then even following, we'd see through all the dispensations that God, you know, worked in, um, man is still wicked and evil. Uh, and we see that even in Revelation when you have, you know, God Himself. Uh, meeting out judgment, and they actually see God from the heavens, and they still repent not. So that's, that's pretty, it's pretty insane. <clears throat> but we have institution of human government, and it's we're told in Romans 13, uh, you can turn back there, it's because he's a minister of God to revenge evil. Okay, we saw the worth, or excuse me, the earth was wicked, it was full of violence, men's hearts only continually imagined evil and wickedness, and God said, hey, look, I'm just done with mankind. Uh, but except for the you know, grace of God upon Noah, and really just Noah being a righteous man. Uh, it's hard to imagine. I honestly don't know how big the population of the earth was at this time. Now, the physical makeup of it was a little different in regard to as far as the continents, mm -hmm. and then even maybe the topography. Yes, sir? I did some calculations one time, just figuring just normal reproductive uh, multiplying and in that 1600 years before the flood there could have been somewhere between 20 and 30 billion people living on this earth it was the whole earth was habitable yes and tropical so it could have supported that many people and there may have been more more people that lived before the flood than have ever lived since wow <laughs> that's amazing that we don't know <laughs> we don't yeah we don't I did, it's not stated um, I guess the best we can guess. And they had incredibly long lifespans at this point. They were living almost to a thousand years. Mm -hmm. I mean, a Methuselah being 969, being the oldest, but Adams and everybody following him live almost fairly close to Methuselah. I usually about, you know, within a <coughs> few hundred years, but at least very, you know, 924, 915, 900 or so, maybe 800. Uh, nevertheless, it's staggering to think, even if you had that big a population, only eight people on the face of the planet were willing to believe God, to trust God, and to accept, you know, what God said. And so he wiped them out, uh, saving Noah and his sons and then their wives. And uh, following that, uh, again, we're back in Romans, I'm sorry, Romans 13. Following that, he institutes government. And then we're told specifically that government is ordained by God, and it's <clears throat> verse 3. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. And in verse 4, uh, he's a minister of God to thee for good, but if thou... Uh, <clears throat> 
if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. He's a minister of God, uh, revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Okay? We need to be restrained. We need government. We need human government in order to be able to restrain evil, to hold back evil. That's its whole purpose. Okay? Uh, so why do we need separation of church and state? Okay? Uh, it's summarized, I think, best here. Uh, even though you have believers in other countries that don't subscribe to this. Or, let me rephrase that. You have believers whose governments don't subscribe to this ideology, but the believers themselves would. Uh, and that is, okay, this is the First Amendment. Okay, so you can't tell, okay, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Okay, the abridging of free speech of the press, or excuse me, or of the press, or the right of people to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Now, what this is, is, okay, the state or the government should not run the church nor dictate its policies. Okay, so in other words, we should be free to be able to worship God, we should be able to uh, freely exercise as far as what we believe what we've come to learn from God's word without restriction from the human government. It is there to revenge evil, but God's not teaching us to commit evil, right? So the state should not uh, dict dictate the church's policies. But as well, the church as an organized body should not run the state. Now, there are caveats to both of these that I'm gonna address. Uh, but overall, what I'm meaning by that is simply um, we see this in early American history, and we see it a lot in European history, actually, the establishment of U.S. Uh, United States of America as a result of the abuses that we'd seen in Europe, uh, which was Catholic Church governed and ruled everything, and, and it was the controlling factor. Uh, and even with the Protestant uh, Reformation, the Protestants that would take over, uh, kick out Catholic Church in portions of Europe, wherever they would rule, still govern as the Catholic Church because they kept the same model, kept the same format. And that was if you don't believe as we do, then we're going to make you pay for it. So they would, um, you know, they would heavily, not just tax, but they would kill. They would persecute uh, Bible believers. Anybody that didn't agree with them, they could just run out and do whatever they want to with them because they had the power. Uh, now they, they govern uh, according to the flesh, and quite honestly, I don't think Catholic, the Catholic Church is a cult. Uh, so it's not. It's not really. <laughs> it's not really God given. Uh, that's not to say that you can't have people that get saved out of that, or that there aren't maybe believers that you would find in there. But uh, fact is, the Catholic Church, from its inception, has been nothing more than just a cult uh, to rule that wants to just rule people. Teacher. Yes. Excuse me. Just, uh, and a good example of that would be the Inquisition. Yes, actually. In Spain, they, they did that. And in uh, France. And um, if you were, that was not so much as political as it was religious, but yeah, that was definitely, if you didn't agree with them, uh, you they tortured you. The, yeah. the burned at the stake. They, they had all mm -hmm. kinds of crazy things that they would do to people. Um, it's just mind-blowing as far as the things that they would implement as far as tortures mm -hmm. uh, for people in the creation. Yes, sir. In Revelation 2, Jesus rebukes, I believe it was the church of Thyatira, because they had there those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The word Nicolaitan means rulers over the people. And that, that church polity was something that God condemned. Yes. Yes. Uh, largely, uh, one, because he's, he's got over us and then as well as far as we're, we're no different. As far as we're, we're all, uh, we're all, Brian is level at the foot of the cross. Um, caveats that we're addressing. Okay, believers are obliged to submit even to ungodly authority. That is kind of hard to deal with, especially as Americans a lot of times. Uh, but the fact is, when we look here, uh, go back to verse 1. It says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there's no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. Um, 
does he give any like exceptions to that? No. Okay. Does, does he make any um, amendments with regard to that? He, in this passage in particular? Not in this passage, but in the book of Acts he does. Yeah. And it, we, we are subject to the higher powers unless they can d command us to do something that's contrary to the scripture, like the baker in or Oregon that was commanded to make a pornographic uh, wedding cake for a couple of homosexuals. I mean, that was, yes. uh, they, they rightly refused to do so. Yes. And here's, uh, go to Acts 4. We'll uh, address that now. Uh, okay, obedience to God trumps obedience to man. And that, that's where, when you have a conflict with regard to governing authority and law and God's commands, um, we have freedom of conscience. Well, you have freedom of conscience as a believer, period. But uh, go to Acts 4. Acts chapter 4. We'll start at verse 13. Okay, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man uh, which was healed standing with them, they could not, uh, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside of the council, they conferred amongst themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? Uh, for they, for indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them. Uh, is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Uh, but it spread no further, or excuse me, but that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they should speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak nor at all, um, or speak not at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Uh, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. Uh, we were to read a little bit later. We should obey God rather than man. Here they're addressing now Israel's governing authority here. They had been wicked for quite a long time, and even the religious authority under which, within their country, their state, um, by which they're governed, is now enacting to them saying, hey, look, you guys can't do this. This is wrong. No, was it? No, it wasn't. Actually, they're, they're just following Jesus' command. Even while Christ was alive, he was being persecuted by religious authority uh, within Israel. They didn't want to receive him. Uh, we're told in John 1, as many, you know, he came unto his own, and his own received them not. But as many as received them to them, gave him power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So it wasn't like he was wholesale rejected. He was rejected overall, uh, by and large, by the society, by the religious authorities, by the government. Uh, but you still had people that would come and believe in droves, actually. Uh, and then we see that at the beginning, uh, just a few chapters earlier, when uh, beginning at Pentecost and following through the rest of the book of Acts, that a large number would come even today still coming to believe on Christ. Uh, nevertheless, when God's commands come into conflict with the human government, you commit yourself as unto a faithful creator. Go to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Well, by the way, you've, you've mentioned two different governments here. You've mentioned the Sanhedrin, uh, Jewish government, the religious government in Israel, uh, but the Roman government in Israel was the real legal authority. Legal authority before And we, we have this picture that's painted by uh, Cecil B. DeMille and different people that, that portray life at that time as if the Roman government was totally evil. If it were totally evil, they would not have spread the way they did. They provided a lot of benefits for people. And if you look at Masada and other the things, the things that happened uh, they and the reasons why Rome uh, or Jerusalem was destroyed, uh, it was because of the rebelliousness of the Jews against the Roman authority, which wasn't, I mean, I, I, don't, I think we need to 
correct our vision of the Romans as being totally evil. They were very secular, they were based on a you know, godless theology kind of thing, but they still were God's constituted government. And our government isn't totally good either. So we, we're no, kind of in the same, uh, same situation in America that they were under, uh, serving under Rome at that time. Yes. Uh, actually, very much so. It's very pagan. Uh, the U.S. is now. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm kind of surprised to how much um, righteousness there's still around. I didn't grow up, I grew up around here, so I'm not, I wasn't exposed until after I was an adult and I left uh, to, I guess you could say, Middle America. And, uh, you know, there, were, there was a lot of righteous people. And I, the stuff that you would see, like from Leave It to Beaver, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I just thought that was TV. I didn't realize that was actually America was very much like that, even still, too, uh, into the 80s and 90s. I decided I never encountered that. So <laughs> I just, when I did, I was like, I was, I was shocked. I was surprised. And then, and then I got saved, and it's like, wow, okay, this is amazing. And we're shocked the other way. Those that grew up in the 50s, we, we, we see the, the degeneration <laughs> well, of America. Yeah, it's pretty bad. But they, you know, there's still, there's still a lot of blessings in America, and we need to use those as much as we can, but yeah, yes. not be under any illusion that, uh, when I was a kid, you know, it's, there were, kind of things that we worshipped and uh, we were taught in the schools to worship science and evolution and all this stuff but we almost always thought that our government was basically good and then we get people like Jimmy Carter and Clinton and Obama come along and we realize that <laughs> maybe we're not so good after all but uh, it's just it's, and even the best of them are not they're, 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 they're holes in, in, in the best of our government so we need to uh, just be aware of that Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, okay, so First Peter, uh, go to chapter three. Actually, chapter two, chapter two, because chapter three addresses some of the other stuff as well. But chapter two. Uh, starting in verse 11. Okay, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Then this seems almost kind of a repeat of what we just read in first, or Romans 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, or unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so, it is, or for so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Um, and this is how we fight uh, evil, it's with good. It's, again, it's not the, we don't do other things, but this, this, is, this is the main way. Okay, it's free and not using your liberty as a cloak for uh, maliciousness, but as servants of God. All right, but as the servants of God, okay, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And then servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Okay, this is interesting. For this is thankworthy of a man for conscience toward God, endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Okay, for what glory is it if, it, if when ye be buffeted uh, for your faults, uh, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. Okay, acceptable being that's well pleasing. That's kind of hard to think. Okay, that why you know why would this please you? <laughs> you know me me being suffered, me being you know punished for something for doing right. Okay, uh, Jesus even spoke of that. That uh, blessed are ye if you're persecuted for His name's sake. Uh, the fact is he was persecuted. Um, you know he's a man of sorrows, a queen of the grief. We're told in Isaiah 53. Uh, and we're, listen, at the best, we're servants. That's, the, that's what we are. Um, regardless of how um, accomplished you might be as a person, the fact is, before God, we're servants. And that's something that we ought to cherish and we ought to let sink in. And the fact is, the servant's not going to rise higher than his master. The master was, you know, beaten, tortured, punished, persecuted constantly. Uh, 
we can't expect any less. And um, yes. It makes sense because um, in the Bible it says that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So he's going to repay. Uh, obeying the Lord above all things first, and then leaving uh, the consequences to Him. You will see it because there's an old Spanish saying also that says, "There's no body that can uh, sustain." A punishment for a hundred years and there's no punishment that would last for a hundred years also so taking God's vengeance into into consideration it makes a lot of sense because yes. he sees everything he sees us suffer when we're not ought to you know and he will right the wrongs yes definitely we see that eventually we see that he says that expressly throughout scripture I think specifically in Revelation when he's speaking to this Billy to the saints that were beheaded and they cry out how long O Lord how long and then wait and see and then he he comes he blesses uh, go to chapter 3 uh, verse starting at verse 8 okay finally be, uh, finally be ye all of one mind having compassion one of another love his brother and be pitiful be courteous not rendering evil for evil or, ruling, or railing for railing but contrary wise blessing knowing that Ye are thereunto called that you should inherit a blessing. Okay, so God will bless us for being a blessing to those that would curse us or despitefully use us, as Jesus said in, in Matthew. Uh, in other words, we're we're called we're called to be a blessing, uh, even if we're abused. Okay, for they that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, that they speak no guile. Okay, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Okay, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to, unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? You know, if God be for us, who could be against us? In Romans, as we're told. Uh, but if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, uh, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But instead, okay, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer. To every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, okay, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Uh, for it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well doing than for evil doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so Again, Christ is our example of those that if we were, if we were suffer, for suffering wrong, for uh, suffering wrong for doing right. Uh, obedience to God trumps all. Again, that, like, that's not always pleasant, but we can, through by the grace of God, uh, be righteous, stand right, not render evil for evil when evil is done to us, and we can't actually see God's power. And the fact that we don't know that God isn't using it. We might not always see the big picture when we're in the midst of the trial. Uh, Job said um, that when he's tried, he shall come forth as gold. And the fact is God's using it to refine you and also to work the situation for a greater good. Uh, the people that are impacted by it. If you think, well, I'm not going to have time for this, but I was going to say go to in Acts 6 uh, after Steve, or, yeah, Stephen preached uh, his sermon. Uh, and he was stoned, and they, 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 uh, the men laid their coats at the foot of one that was Saul. Uh, he cried out to them. Uh, well, he actually cried out to the Lord, not to them necessarily, but they overheard that uh, Stephen said, you know, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. This is a man that's being killed. Uh, in the moment of his death, you would think, I, I mean, I would, in my flesh, I would probably want to respond, like, just cry out, be angry, want to retaliate of some sort. Uh, but he's, he's crying out to God, lay not this sin to their charge. Uh, and what did he do? He just, he didn't do anything wrong. And he just preached them the word of God. And we see later, following uh, the road to Damascus and many things that Paul received, uh, you know, after he received Christ and followed the Lord, he would, he, he would himself be persecuted, but he would respond the same way. Uh, we see that he, he would cry out uh, for others that Lord made not descend to their charge. I think that was the influence of Stephen, I can't, that's conjecture, but I, uh, the influence of, wow, okay, 
God using the death of Stephen before him uh, to influence his life. Okay, and then two, we are to influence the world, so withdraw is an appropriate response. Okay, uh, we are to influence the world. We're told that we're supposed to be salt and light uh, unto the world. Okay, Gates, what I mean by that, okay, Jesus said with regard to the church that he's going to build it, and he also said about it that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. So that's what I'm referencing here when it says gates are a defensive measure, not an offensive one. Okay, so if you are attacking gates of somewhere, that's because we're on, we are on the offense and somebody's on the defense. They're trying to protect themselves from somebody coming in or try to keep something from going out. But if it's being attacked, it's because they're, being, uh, they're guarding themselves. Okay, so the gates of hell. We're, <laughs> we, we are Christ who has all authority given unto him. And so he tells us, go to all the world, you know, preach the gospel, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded us. Uh, Satan is a strong adversary. Mind you, I can't take him on in my own strength. And it's not that I'm supposed to have some kind of... Uh, I should have a healthy fear because the fact is, is those, those creatures are yeah, they're more mightier than I, but the fact is... Uh, if I put on the whole armor of God, I'm able to stand and withstand, and I'm able to go ahead and do, under the power of His Holy Spirit, what He's commanded me. We're able to see lives changed, souls saved, uh, communities impacted. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Because we are, uh, we already have the victory. That's the reason how that comes from what you just said. Amen. Yes, yes. And it's because of Christ. Um, there's a little... I had a hard time finding a picture because he wasn't... You got the picture distorted there. You got stretched it horizontally. Yes. <laughs> I, need, I, need, I need to fix that. Okay. Um, we wouldn't really know who this is unless we've read a book about this man, but his name's Shubal Stearns. He was originally from Massachusetts, and then he came down to North Carolina. And then he, within, uh, I'd say maybe like 20, 30 year period, uh, was able to influence a number of, I guess you could call them preachers, preacher boys, mm -hmm. that would go out and start churches uh, from where he was at in Sandy Creek, North Carolina. What's his uh, name? Shubal Stearns. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with him or not. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's if you were to read in any kind of Baptist history literature, look, Shubal Stearns or uh, Daniel Marshall was another one. Uh, associate of his, and uh, they were responsible, I think, within their lifetime. Uh, not him. It's attributed to him, but he wasn't, he didn't start 133 churches. It was him and his associates. In other words, he had, he started about three or four, and then it, he had something like 18 or 22 associates that basically would go out, and then they would start multiple churches. So in, in effect, before he passed, it would have been a roughly around 133 and the southern part of the U.S., I'm not sure if many of you are familiar. What I mean by that would be stemming down from north, uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line out towards Texas. Okay, so what would, even though Texas is really southwest and their history is a little later, but you would have the influence of Missouri, Kentucky, uh, Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, technically Southern Maryland uh, and a, a large part of Maryland, even Virginia as well uh, because of the, whatever constitutes a south of Mason-Dixon line. Uh, the face of it, even even though you don't see a lot of it within the last 30 years probably, but it, it's still present enough that you would go around uh, actually you can go around now and you can see you can see like a Baptist church in almost every corner. I mean, my, my, mind you, a lot of them are probably contemporary, but you still have, you go door knocking in most any community in the South. Um, and again, this maybe like a big generalization, but you have, most everybody has been grown up in church. They're familiar enough with the Word of God that you can, you know, most people, it's, <laughs> it's hard to find somebody that is either not saved 
or at least doesn't have some kind of religious influence, as opposed to like if you were to go up to the north, anywhere north of the mason dixon line. Usually, I consider maybe like the northeast, go to Massachusetts or uh, Connecticut or Rhode Island, Maine, um, New York. Uh, not You have pockets of that there, but by and large, historically, you would have had that. Uh, it's what's considered the Bible Belt. Now, why was that? Bible Belt became the Bible Belt because, um, well, in particular, well, it's not all necessarily to John Leland. John Leland was able to influence John Adams to go ahead and give us the first amendment. And then um, we were given freedom. Uh, well, believers back then were given freedom as far as to go ahead and be able to exercise without persecution. Yes? <clears throat> Question. Is the Baptist church, each Baptist church self-government, governed, or are they all under an assembly or some kind of union, or how does that work? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Actually, they're, they all should be independent. Not all of them are. Not all of them act like that. Um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't really know unless you kind of attend there and ask questions, or you just ask the, the leadership there. Uh, you have, and this is dating back to 1800s, even maybe sometimes a little 1700s, but maybe like the 1800s, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention and Northern Baptist Conventions that were started. Initially, they were started as fellowships, and that was because even during the time uh, <coughs> while the U.S. was still growing and prior and following the Civil War, um, the Baptist churches, though there were a lot of them in what's considered the Bible Belt, um, they weren't, I guess, as strong as what you could say the mainline, like the ones that started from Protestants that had come over from Europe. So what they did was they would have, what they called them camp meetings. And so basically they would have these yearly fellowships and then they would eventually become monthly. And so, and so they organized themselves in that manner to, as, as a kind of a loose fellowship, say, okay, hey, we fellowship with these people, we fellowship with that people. But later on, they would become organized and they became behaving kind of like a denomination would, where, okay, you have, I think, for me, it's easy to think of it like as a business. Uh, when you have a business that has many franchises, so you have home office, wherever that would be located, and then they dictate policy to you know, all the other branches that want to be associated out of that, unless they just go ahead and say, they buy out and they say, okay, now we're on, we do whatever we want to. So, but in it, biblically, they should be doing what they want to. And by that, I mean as far as what's led, how the Holy Spirit is leading them, you know, according to Scripture. But not, not all of them act like that. So you don't really know until you kind of, you, sometimes you get an idea as far as based on, you know, we're Southern Baptist or uh, they don't really have Northern Baptist anymore. Um, but there's other there's other groups that kind of act the same way. What was Billy Graham? Uh, he would have been Southern Baptist. Mm -hmm. He was Southern Baptist. Um, I'm sorry. One of the things the Southern Baptist Church does is, oh, there are two, two, I think, main functions that I've seen. They, uh, first of all, print a lot of literature, the Broadman Press and Broadman Foundation. They present great print Sunday school literature and things like that, and they tend to consolidate the views of Southern Baptist churches through that literature. The other thing they do, and this is where they exercise some control, if somebody wants to go and start a Southern Baptist church, then uh, they will finance it for them, and then, then they have, he who controls the purse strings, um, really controls the local church. So they're not independent as we are. No, uh, actually, it's neat. Their missionaries don't even have to go on deputation. They, uh, they were called. They get reviewed. They're accepted, and they're basically paid in full as far as to be able to go and go without having to run deputation. Um, without having to what? Oh, go on deputation. A missionary, somebody that would be going overseas. Oh. Uh, the thing is, uh, to start churches, uh, not. There's a lot of countries that have restrictions on religious workers coming over. So uh, that's why you have organizations like mission boards to go act as a buffer and basically act as a, 
um, not as a buffer, but basically act as a accrediting agency, I guess you could say, for the individual coming through, uh, and to work as a liaison with the with the foreign government um, that they're going to be going to, uh, under which they're going to go to go to start a church. They provide some financial stability too, for the, yes. for the missionary. So he's, if if his church drops away, then he can then they can at least you know they'll take care of their physical needs and things. Yes. Uh, does that make, yes, I'm sorry. I think another thing too that becomes predominant is that probably even more in the 40s and, and with this thing with the Baptists that you're talking about is um, personal separation. Everything started becoming more and more divisive. The, 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 when you had those organizations, that's when the independence really started pulling away because of those conventions because personal yeah. separation was really getting watered down. Yes, there was that. That was a big thing. Um, most people think of uh, J. Frank Norris, but then you also had like Lee Robertson, John R. Rice, and all those that broke away as well. Um, a lot of those guys came from Texas, but it wasn't just exclusively there. There's guys up north and from all over. And um, Lord really uses men. Uh, I guess to uh, summarize, God used that man to be able to go ahead and. Uh, influence a lot of other people to go ahead and start a lot of churches and then the Bible Belt was transformed. Okay. Getting back it was getting back to my point of that uh, we're to be salt and light. So separation of church and say isn't that we withdraw from the world like the Amish and say, hey, we're just gonna be our own entity into ourselves and do our own thing. Even though we want that, we want to be free to, you know, live uh, quiet, peaceful lives um, and worship God and serve God, but we have a task and a mandate. Uh, and then wherein that comes into conflict with government, we obey God rather than man, uh, but we are to be seeking to be good citizens, and if we're going to be appropriate salt and light, we will influence our community, and we'll see it transformed by the grace of God. That's okay. great. Uh, any questions you guys can ask? Well, the one uh, thing I think that, that I have conflicts about with separation of church and state is where do you stand with somebody when there's something just outwardly wicked like abortion? Uh, do you go out and crusade against it? Do you preach against it in the church? Do you, yes. uh, well, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Do, should we do anything else besides that? Should we get involved in protests against abortion and things like that? Uh, it's, there's, there's a line you have to draw there. Is, are we neglecting the gospel just because when we camp, camp on an issue like that, we've got to really be careful. But on the other hand, if we, neglo we neglect an issue like homosexuality or or abortion, then we're uh, we're just giving uh, consent to evil. That's true. Um, best scenario with regard to that, we most of the people making those decisions are just because they don't know Christ. We inf we seek to influence them with regard to that. We have the opportunity here in this country to be able to go ahead and vote and to participate legislatively and, and so influence, yes as well, run for office. So we ought to have um, Christians that don't bow down to, um, you know, public pressure with regard to stance. Uh, that's hard to find. I hate to say it, it's kind of weird, but it is kind of hard to find. We're seeing more of it now, we're seeing a resurgence within the last few years but it's hard to find individuals that won't have, uh, basically they have the backbone to say, hey look, I'm not, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do right and not just compromise for votes to, to be uh, reelected or to stay in power or whatever. Uh, most of those, well, whatever, most, a lot of politicians are bought off by lobbyists. So the fact is what we need is we need people that are not gonna be money-centered, but rather principle-centered and then govern on the basis of, okay, what is right, what does God say? And then make decisions on that basis and then we, as uh, constituents, we need to support them because uh, otherwise they're not they're not going to get very far. And I, I'd say monetarily, I'd vote for them, go out campaign for them, uh, and such. I'm sorry, does that answer your question? No. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> um, we need to dismiss. I'm sorry because I don't want to hold up the rest of the service. But I, not that I don't want to regard your question, but I'd be at anymore. Just go ahead and ask. Uh, we're dismissed.